Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. We begin tonight with the fight for the soul of our democracy. If you've been watching this show lately, then you're familiar with this map. It shows the 43 states that are considering more than 250 bills that would restrict voting in some way. 11 of those states are trying to restrict mail-in voting. Nine of them are trying to purge voter rolls, which would disqualify people who are eligible to vote. And eight of them want you to jump through new hoops to show ID when you did not have to show it before. Over the past few weeks, we've highlighted a few of these states. We've talked to organizers in Georgia after the state legislature there rolled out a new series of bills to restrict voting. We've spoken to the secretaries of state in Michigan and in Arizona about legislation in those states, including two laws in Arizona that are now being challenged in the Supreme Court. But while all of this was happening, Republicans in Texas looked around the room and they were like, hold my beer. The GOP-controlled legislature in Texas is now considering more than two dozen pieces of legislation that will restrict voting. And they especially want to stop the kind of voting that happened in the big urban parts of Texas. Houston and Harris County let voters use drive through instead of risking COVID by standing in line at the polls. Texas Republicans really hated that, and now they want it gone. As the Washington Post editorial board put it today, that Texas Republicans are almost surgical in their cynicism. And they can basically pass whatever restrictions they want. Republicans in Texas control the state legislature. They control the governorship. If they are determined to go ahead with this, there is basically nothing to stop them. At least not in Texas. In Washington, D.C., though, in our nation's capital, there is a bill that would stop Texas and stop Georgia and stop the other Republican-controlled states from making it harder to vote. The same group that has been tracking state bills around the country says the federal bill known as H.R. 1 would make a huge difference if it passed. The Brennan Center for Justice says H.R. 1, also known as the For the People Act, would supersede virtually every voter suppression bill in the states. H.R. 1 would create a standard of basic access to the polls that every American could rely upon. H.R. 1 passed the House this month, and now the question is, when will the Senate bring the bill to the floor and if it will be able to pass? For that, Senate Democrats will have to use some muscle because the filibuster now stands in the way. And starting us off tonight, Eddie Gloud, Chair of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University, Professor Gloud, and Chuck Rocha. He's a Democratic strategist and a Texas native and author of the book, Tio Bernie, the inside story of how Bernie Sanders brought Latinos into the political revolution. Okay, Chuck, I wanna start with you. Do you see the Texas restrictions as designed to target a specific group of voters? Is it like blatantly obvious to you that this is racist? Uh, yes, it is. And I can prove that because Texas has changed a lot since I was a young man, which was a long time ago when it was a majority white state. And what you have is you have, this is going to shock a lot of you, a lot of white, old, powerful men who are trying to cling onto the power that they have had since the late great Ann Richards gave up the last statewide Democratic seat almost 28 years ago. Just this week, yesterday, the uh, Houston Chronicle reported that Texas AG Ken Paxton spent 22 hundred staff hours to go through all the new voter registration to try to find, you know, something to back up that there's fraudulent stuff going on. And he found 16 cases of people mistakenly putting the wrong address on out of 17 million voters in Texas. That's <laughs> one example of how there's no fraud. There's nothing going on. And the last statistic I'll give you in Texas, the public schools in Texas, what these white Republicans are trying to hang on to is a demographic explosion that's happening. Only 27% of the school age kids in Texas in public schools are white. All the rest of those children are multiracial, they're Latino, they're black, they're Asian, because you're seeing this beautiful multicultural essence that is bubbling up to Texas. And these white Male Republicans are trying to hang on to that to limit everybody else but voting except for them. Just to reiterate what you said, you said 17 instances where people put the incorrect information out of how many million was that? 17 million. Okay. That's 16 out of 17 million. 16 yes. and 17 million. So there's like mad yeah. zeros at the end of that. Um, yeah. That is an insane statistic. <laughs> Eddie, tonight in Georgia, um, I feel like another statistic is when corporations realize that it is in their profit, their interest of their profit, um, to support particular things politically, 
um, they do that. So you've seen Coca-Cola and Home Depot. They're taking a stand against these voter suppression bills. Do you think they'll do you think that kind of thing will get Republicans attention in Georgia or Texas or anywhere with big corporations standing on one side of this line? Um, it could. There's no guarantee. You know, there is the uh, the response of the Georgia state legislature to uh, efforts around Del Delta Airlines and, and gun control. And, and Delta took a hit for that. So I think what we saw from companies like Coca-Cola, Aflac, UPS, uh, Home Depot and Delta in Georgia, there was a cautious kind of step. They, they announced that they were committed to uh, broad democracy to eligible voters and the like. We need them to be more aggressive. I think uh, the uh, grassroots activists on the ground are bringing pressure to bear not only to, against these companies, but I think they also need to bring in athletics, the SEC. Remember what the SEC did in the state of Mississippi? Mm. It helped bring down that flag, the Confederate flag. So this is part of the strategy, but look, it can help, but there's no guarantee. That's the short answer. But isn't there precedent, um, Eddie, about, uh, you know, businesses actually standing on one side of a political or a social issue and actually it affecting change? I mean, it was we didn't get to go into integrated hotels because white Americans wanted to be nice and let us in their hotels. It was about uh, the fact that we have money to spend in these places. Um, so is it is it sort of that capitalist angle? Is that maybe the, the thing that shifts some of these Republicans and makes them, I don't know, stop introducing hundreds and hundreds of bills all over the country? I mean, it. It could. I mean, I think there, there, is, there is historical precedence. You're right. I mean, when we think about uh, the civil rights movement, it's not just simply the, the, the actions, the bravery of everyday ordinary people uh, marching and organizing. It also had something to do with the Cold War and the United States trying to position itself as the defender of the free world and how U.S. business was being hurt by the images being sent around the world of Bull Connor and his dogs and fire hoses and the like. So there is a sense in which once we get a, once the bottom line is affected by policy, corporations begin to speak back. They could they could hold back their money for for uh, state legislators, their campaigns and the like. So it can have an effect. But what we're witnessing here is a moment that also has historical precedent, a moment when an assertion of whiteness that this country must remain a white nation in the vein of old Europe trumps everything. This is an echo, Zerlina, of the end of Reconstruction. This is an echo mm -hmm. of what of the response to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. There are these moments when there's a reassertion of the whiteness of the country that sometimes trumps, no pun intended, right, the bottom line. No, it's the right word to use there. I try to avoid it. <laughs> um, it actually came up today. Um, Chuck, how, how should de Democrats uh, on the ground in Texas respond to this? I mean, I feel like you, you've seen the corporate corporations taking a stand. You see activists um, trying to push back. You see uh, folks in other states doing work on the ground, like Stacey Abrams, to do you know ad campaigns to try to raise awareness of the fact that Republicans are doing this. I mean, what what are... What's the role of Democrats in this moment? Um, is HR1 their only hope? Mm. I think we have to think about the visual here. And I think the visual here is very powerful. If you think about the fight that Governor Greg Abbott, who is a 63-year-old white man who's the governor, who wants to fight with Len Lena, Lena Hildago, who is the county executive in Harris County, which is Houston for all of you folks at home. So this young Latina, this young woman of color runs the largest county in Texas and governs that county, which is bigger than like six New England states. And she's a 30 year old woman of color fighting with a 63 year old white man trying to hang on to power. That is a very powerful sign when what those numbers I just gave you with 53 percent of the school kids in Texas are Latino. It's the future of where the power lies in a state. And when you draw that distinction of who's fighting with who and you have a 30 year old woman of color running the largest county saying, I just want people to be able to vote. The more we talk about that as grassroots organizer, the way you speak truth to power, I think that's how you take back some of that control and win in these places. To Chuck's point about the fact that, you know, the optically it doesn't look great when it's a young woman of color uh, up against an old, older white man who's trying to, you know, maintain power. Are Republicans, Eddie, do you think thinking about the backlash? I mean, one of the things that makes this moment distinct from right after Reconstruction 
is that we are emerging into a multiracial democracy where the majority of the electorate, and already in Texas this is the case, uh, are not white. Yeah, I don't think they're worried about the backlash. I don't think this is the smart move, uh, given the demographic shifts that are immediate and on the horizon. I think they're all trying to play Donald Trump's playbook. How do we get these disaffected white voters to turn out in massive numbers? We play to white fear, white grievance, white hatred, white resentment. Uh, that's what I see them trying to do. But look, I think it, this is a clear choice, Zerlina. Either you're for democracy or you're against it. Either you're for Americans voting or mm -hmm. you're not. There's no in between. And so we need to say that to the Joe Manchins. We need to say that to the Christian Sen Senator Cinema, right? There's no moderate position between these two. So, you know, it's, it's funny. And I just, I was thinking about this as we were talking. It's funny how there's always this cry from the Democratic Party that the left should get in line. Well, damn it, we need to get Joe Manchin in line. We need to get Cinema in line, right? Because if, if we cannot pass HR1 and the John Lewis voting rights bill without in some ways narrowing the, 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 the filibuster, then, 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 we need to, then we need to really make the argument to do so, right? And I think if, if Manchin is gonna hold that up, we need to hold him accountable. So uh, it's a choice, it's a stark choice. There's no in-between, Zerlina, there's no in-between. That's so, so true. And Chuck, one thing I was thinking uh, as Eddie was talking is, why does it work to stoke racist resentment among white voters do the white voters care that that's what elected Republicans are doing? Because I don't know if if Democrats came out and tried to attract black people, I don't know, by, you know, dressing in hip hop clothes. I don't know what it would be, what the stereotype would be of that particular <laughs> voting block. But if they did that, I feel like it would be insulting. Are white is are the is the white Republican base not insulted that the elected Republicans think that by repeatedly being racist that they will get, you know, get more support? I think you've seen people like Brother Eddie talk about this in the morning shows about how this culture, the white people have had a 300 year advantage over us, right? And they're a lot more out front with the way that they think about it. And they're trying to grasp onto power by making and doubling down like Donald Trump actually taught them to do, to try to stoke the biggest fears amongst them, especially when you have an electorate that's only about a quarter of the universe. And in a midterm election, these folks know that there's just a small group of people are going to vote. If I was running races in Texas tomorrow, and I'm still starting to put that together now, I would talk about the failures that affected all Texans, like this snowstorm that made everybody down there be without power or be without drinking water. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican or what color your skin is. When you can't turn on the refrigerator or give your baby the water, then your government has let you down. We should be talking about that because it cuts across all of these races and all these income levels to say your government has failed you, and that's why we need to change now. So that the same question to you, Eddie, is essentially, do the white voters in Texas who are sitting without power and water, do they notice that the, the elected Republicans, all that they're talking about is like Dr. Seuss and cancel culture. They're not talking about solutions to fix the power grid. Is, does that go unnoticed by voters just because they have racist resentment towards people of color? I don't get that, but I'm asking. I don't know. You know, yeah, I don't either. I don't either, and I think there are, you know, there, there are various levels of value and commitment. I mean, at the same time that you have folk who are worried about, uh, you know, the heat in the context of the winter storm and, and the electrical grid, uh, you had Governor Abbott try to change the subject by, by lifting the mask uh, mandate, right? Uh, and, and putting all of Texas citizens in, in jeopardy with regards to the UK variant of, of, of COVID-19. And so, but then we heard clamoring among a certain constituency, this notion of liberty, this idea of liberty as being a synonym for selfishness in some ways. So you don't know what motivates people to, to make their political choices. Mm. Uh, but I do know this, is that there's some bottom line issues that confront everyday ordinary Americans about government failing them. And then there are some, there's some, shall we say, existential fears about demographic shifts that are going to change the basic fabric of American life. Those things are, are happening all at once, Elena. So who knows what will happen? Is there it's, so, it's so interesting to watch all of this unfold because we are living through history. Eddie Gloud and Chuck Rocha, thank you so much to you both for being here. And please stay safe.
Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.